Since our founding, the hours we work, the tasks we perform, the services we provide, and above all, the way we provide these services, have all supported our singular mission, improving the quality of life of our people and those we serve. This is the most important differentiator of our company. It makes what we do unique. It is a source of pride and inspiration for all of us who work at Sodexo. Today, we take a step further towards our goal of improving quality of life by unifying the way we envision it and how we embed it into every aspect of our work. Following extensive research, we identified six dimensions known to affect quality of life on which our services have a direct impact. Ease and efficiency. Imagine a world where everything runs smoothly, whether dropping the kids off in the morning or heading to a meeting. Sodexo services open the doors to a world where you can devote your full attention to the task at hand, rather than being distracted by logistics. A world where you can maintain a work-life balance. Health and well-being. A truly healthy lifestyle requires an holistic approach. Maintaining overall physical well-being involves adopting healthy eating habits, having access to well-balanced meals, and maintaining regular physical activity. Recognition. Is recognition a powerful source of motivation? Yes. Being recognized for a job well done is a vital component of quality of life, allowing individuals to select their own rewards based on their interests ensures that they feel genuinely appreciated. Physical environment. Did you know that the design of a space has a critical impact on our perception of personal safety and comfort? From optimal lighting to a reliable source of clean air to a safe building structure, purposefully designed and well-maintained environments bolster quality of life wherever you are. Social interaction. A friendly conversation over a cup of coffee. A lunchtime break with classmates. An afternoon companion for the elderly. Creating an atmosphere that is conducive to social interaction can produce very productive outcomes for individuals. Personal growth. Improving one's quality of life can start with taking a class, learning a new skill, or mastering an area of expertise. Whether developing a current path or changing directions altogether, building upon one skill set creates the opportunity to achieve personal goals. These dimensions constitute our common definition of quality of life. We improve quality of life by having a positive impact on one, several, or all of these dimensions through the services we deliver. These dimensions are at the heart of the experience we provide to the individuals we serve day in and day out. So I just wanted to, um, for, um, you've heard the topic, so I want to acknowledge that this program um, is endorsed by um, Alzheimer's Australia New South Wales, and um, also it was part of a commissioned research project to pilot the program, so I'll just start with that, and then... Um, I'll tell you a lot more uh, about that and also give you little bits of the research findings because just to sh show, you know, we, we looked at the implementation of the program and um, what people thought of it. So setting the scene, right, with the uh, butterflies, I am a peculiarity. I am um, humbly, I will declare that I'm a European African and also a legal alien. So I've been born and bred in South Africa. I've lived there all my life. I love my country. And for the last um, three years, oh, this thing is moving, or I'm moving it. Um, I have been living in Sydney, Australia, um, and really um, having the benefit of uh, enjoying new research experiences and work experiences, especially in aged care. 
So uh, for the past 20 years, I've been involved in residential aged care, and for me, residential care is long-term facilities, uh, mostly. And um, yes, and, and I've had the privilege, I've worked in Florida, and I've worked in the UK a little bit, but the one thing that seems constant, I mean, here at the Pioneer Network, we get all fired up, we, because we hear a lot about things that work, but person-centered care has got a long way to go even though it's starting to work in some places. Um, so um, for me, one of the, I don't know, highlights of my career is that I am still uh, one of the directors of the Eden Alternative South Africa, and Eden has been in South Africa for the past, um, since 2012, so that's been wonderful. Um, yes, but, so I am, um, in my day-to-day -day work, I teach at the university, and then for research only, they let me out and I can get into residential care facilities, which is really nice for me. That's what I enjoy doing. So I just thought I'll share a little bit more. Since I've had the past two weeks in the US, and um, I was not born here, but I've really enjoyed my visit. I've got a goddaughter who lives in Sheboygan, and I had time to meet up with him for a long weekend. Um, I could enjoy the sights of Chicago, but the thing that we all, well, my uh, most enjoyable memory will be this sign, which said, when we drove down and explored Door County, enroll today. And then when we had a good look, that was the fence that they used to put that up on. I think it was some sort of a primary school or whatever. But that, um, that was quite interesting, and we enjoyed that. So now um, that you hopefully know a little bit more about me, I just sort of want to have an idea who is with me today. So uh, we are so few in the room, so it would be nice if people just want to say their, their first name and perhaps you know, their role and where they're from. That would be very nice. Um, my name is Anne Lee. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm operations coordinator. Thank you, Emily. My name is Brenda, and I'm from San Diego, California. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and I'm a CNA. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I'm Serena. I'm the executive director of 54 Apartment Memory here in the St. Louis area. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm from Los Angeles and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm a director of Thank you. My name is Christina. I'm an administrator, and I'm from Bonita. My name's Uwaiju, I'm a dry lab bed nurse, mm -hmm. and I'm from Bonita. My name's Joy, and I'm a social worker, and I'm from Michigan. Uh, I'm Annette Winsler, and I'm the Chief Nurse Executive for Signature Healthcare and Blue Woman in St. Louis. Carol Kreschke from Denver, Colorado. I'm the president of the Colorado Culture Change Coalition. By the way, you're, I hope you all come next year. It's going to be in Denver. Oh. <laughs> Good advertisement. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and, and, and welcome. Um, Joy is going to be my timekeeper, so I've got a, a few things that I'd like to fit in, but I want to ask whether somebody will be the well-being officer. So, um, you know, we're advanced in our attendance. People get tired if we need to stand up. So I, I, I actually think it will need to be somebody at the back before you leave, that's all right. We, we'll just need somebody at the beginning. So if you can see people drooping, and the other thing, obviously, I mean, my six months working in Florida, I told a group yesterday, the only American I can speak is by saying, Southern Baptist Church. But the rest, I know that my accent might not be um, what you are used to. So if you need me to repeat anything, perhaps you'll all join and be well-being officers today. If I need to stop, if you need to stand up, if I need to repeat something, and as I'm nervous and English is my second language, you will also, you know, see that I'm a, I might get flustered and I might repeat something because I thought too quickly and didn't speak quick enough or something like that. Okay, so um, 
if we move on and actually start, I think what, what is important um, for me with a focus here on dementia is that dementia care is extremely complex. And often we expect people who are not well equipped to deal with situations um, you know, that, that is quite out of their reach um, and that they don't understand. So we really have to think carefully if, if we want to address culture change um, towards people who are prone to loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And a lot of that, I mean, we've got quite a bit of leadership here today, but a lot of that, and I'm sorry, you have to help me with terminology. In, in Australia, they say care manager, but a lot of that falls on the, on the care manager within an um, um, organization or within a home. And, um, you know, the lead that they take to assist those people who are vulnerable and frail uh, um, to live a, a life worth living. So the role that care managers play, they are usually appointed due to their uh, expertise and skills associated with medical care, and not because of their leadership skills. Um, so they are often set up, and they have a very challenging job, especially if a, if a home or organization has still got a long way to go when we think about person-centered care. So the program that I'm going to tell you about today, oh, grief, here we go, is... Um, was specifically designed for an organization, a national organization in Australia with 94 homes. So, so you know, I need to give you this background because definitely you're going to see terminology like the F word for facility. Um, and I think the one that's the hardest for me is BPSD. I have got a little bit of dyslexia and I really initially could not get all those letters in the correct order um, because they just go against my soul. Um, yeah, but so if people expressing their needs and wants is, when it's labeled as BPSD, just remember this is due to funding requirements and also within this organization to ensure that communication between the 94 homes across Australia, which is rather large, is similar and people understand what is meant by it. So you'll see that there's quite a few things um, that is hard in some ways when you try to promote person-centered care because it's against what we at Pioneer Network would feel is true person-centeredness. But this is a stepping stone and this is an approach. And it was developed for a very, very specific setting. So, so this, the, the goal of this whole program was to, to look at, um, to develop unified leadership teams to mentor staff in the translation of enhanced person-centered uh, dementia knowledge and skill that enables person-centered relationship focus, thinking, values, and care behavior for people with dementia, the staff, um, and families. So that was, was the, the whole thing behind it. And it was developed by um, somebody with a nursing background called Judy Weaver, and I really want to acknowledge her. She's got a passion for uh, working with people living with dementia. And the whole thing here was to look at the peer leader and to provide them with an enablement role. So um, it, it's somebody that encouraged everybody to contribute, somebody who... Uh, is non-judgmental um, and do not engage in critical speech, um, that ask how and what and trying to avoid the why questions, um, pick up on feeling words from, from the staff and reflect that back. So, you know, it's, it's all about validating staff and getting um, a process in motion that will adopt staff ideas so that they feel empowered and part of solutions and part of the process. So, um, and it's a very, very practical approach. So the program was designed, um, first of all, there was a separate care manager workshop just to give them a, a background and an overview. And then we had a three month program with two days of workshops because people had to travel um, in the different areas to get there. And um, they would get, if I can put it like homework, so we'll, we taught them something and they had to take it back and try and implement it. So while they were away in between our times together, uh, we did a follow-up telephonic 
conversation to encourage them to hear what worked and what didn't work, um, to help them brainstorm a little bit. Um, but mostly it was to sort of support them in their long line of busyness to implement something in a different way. So, um, this is just an overview of the program. So, so, so you know, the, the main focus was looking at the group problem solving program as we're going to look at it today. Um, but then, the, there were certain things that Judy felt um, through her experience needed addressing and also things that the, um, the top leadership of this large organi organization wanted to be addressed, and those were things, so my background is occupational therapy. I'm not what you'll call a typical rehab person because my focus is on staff training and well-being um, and encouraging meaningful engagement on different levels, but definitely I don't have a background um, in, you know, associated with management of pain or identifying delirium. And that made this a very, very interesting program to be part of because even though I was the facilitator or the guide, um, you know, in a, we, we had nine facilitators or guides, we weren't experts in, in everything. So there was, topics were introduced with enough information and support, but it was about using the people attending and their knowledge and background to contribute. No, this was, this was staff member to staff member, and it was from all different um, categories. Some people got it more right than others, whether it was catering or, um, I, sorry, I don't know what, what um, the terminology would be here, but uh, people from, um, um, who addressed cleaning. It was really people who were employed and part of the team within the residential care home. Okay. So... So topics were delirium superimposed on dementia. It, it was, um, yeah, it, it was a lot about looking at medication, the impact of medication, the impact of antipsychotic drugs. Um, why are they prescribed? Do they need to be uh, prescribed? And, and creating a lot of awareness. So um, the program is structured in this way. so that it can support that care manager as a leader to become a peer enabler to other team members. So it was all about um, um, providing support, looking at how to, to guide learning um, within the complex I environments, and also the way that it was spread out was so that people could go back and do little bits at a time and see what the impact of that was and bring it back so that we could address those things that work but make, uh, really make sure that we um, discuss in depth the things that didn't work. Um, and they were also then su uh, supplied with tools, things like the Abbey Pain Scale, things that if they weren't aware of what's out there and what was easy to use, um, we actually used that. We had lots of practical activities during the workshops. Um, so it's all about thinking about how to increase learning associated with that person-centered, relationship-focused care. And also, um, you know, in the end, one thing that was really clear was that staff left often, and we'll get to some of that when, when I talk about the study. But so it's about increasing staff satisfaction so that you can keep them there, and also to increase the well-being of everybody, whether it's you know the team members or the elders living in the facility. So it's about both those who render and those who receive the support and care. Um, so... <laughs> Guiding care culture change, this was all about uh, um, finding, not, not wanting to get people to do more. Um, and, and that's because, you know, that's the resistance for the change. So trying to tell people it's not about doing th more, but is, is looking at what you are doing and trying to find a new way to do that. So that was really rather important. Um, because this whole complex complexity of working in environments and in, in, in introducing new things, it, it, this peer enablement program gave the opportunity to care managers um, to create a learning environment that in, enabled person-centered 
relationship directed care and to feel the impact of that, to actually see that that decrease, could decrease their workload in some ways. So, just to make sure that everybody feels part of this process, because we use transformational um, leadership and learning, I want you to talk to somebody next to you. Just think about um, somebody who inspires you. Um, you know, somebody who actually had a major influence on your life choice. Why did you choose to do what you do? If we all think back, there was somebody or something that inspired us. So just to get the juices flowing and people not falling asleep, quickly speak to the person next, um, next to you. Think back about why you started doing what you're doing and what was it about that person that really influenced you. Okay, everyone. So let's just quickly see. I'm a little camel now. So I'm using my hands too much when I speak, so I interfere with sound. <laughs> um, can I have volunteers? Does somebody want to? Was there an inspirational story somewhere? Just would need like one lovely example. Who wants to share? Not all at once. Thank you. <laughs> um, mine's not necessarily about work, but just uh, someone who has been an influence in my life um, and who I did not want to admit that she was an influence in my life until much later is my mom. Hmm. Um, she was very, she was a very young mother and um, didn't have a lot of time for me because she was working and things like that. Um, but she really showed me what what hard work and perseverance is about, you know, and I became a young mother myself, um, and so following her example, you know, uh, and learning from her that I can push through, I can get through school, I can have a job, I can provide for my child, and I can also make some time for that, for my child, more so than she did, so. Yeah. That's lovely, and I must actually um, say that most people, I mean, personally, I went into care because of very inspirational grandparents. I always thought that, you know, they basically, had, according to me, had it made, and I'd like people with advanced dementia to have a little bit of what they had. But thank you very much. So, so if we look at the, um, at the next one, this is a little bit more general, but in your larger groups, or when you just do, that's fine. Um, but think about somebody that you consider a famous leader, um, that changed lives of many people for the better. What do you think are their inspiring characteristics? Um, what similarities do you see? Because, you know, I'm sure you'll have different people to consider when you talk about that. I'm going to give you another two or three minutes to do that. Okay. I, I'm just going to ask... Um, at the back, can you just give us examples of who the, who the people were? I don't know whether you'd need the mic, sorry, but here we go, just that everybody can hear. One of the pretty influential people across the board, not necessarily right now, for me was Golda Meir um, from Israel, the Prime Minister of Israel. Just being young and seeing somebody that was so passionate about what she did and would never give up um, because she believed in something. And when, wh now, when, when we work with our seniors, I'm in memory care, the passion that they deserve something better and they deserve a good life. And if you're very passionate, then we kind of go out of our way to make sure that that happens and don't stop until it does happen. Thank you. Anybody else have got an example for us? Well, I, I'm inspired by Dr. Thomas. He um, is the founder of the Eden Alternative. And what's interesting about him is that he saw things differently. He was a medical director of a nursing home when he realized that what he was doing wasn't enough. And he's acted on that, very entrepreneurial, very charismatic, very intelligent, and a true leader because he stands back and lets others lead as well, so he makes him a follower. 
And he's worked on this for a very long time, and he's not giving up. And that's what we have to do. We have to not give up. Thank you. Um, I, I find it really interesting. I mean, th obviously, when, when I think about an inspirational leader, I, I would think about Nelson Mandela or um, Mother Teresa. And, and when we, we did this exercise in Australia, many people shared, um, I got a whole bit of nursing history, lots of names of people that I never heard of, and, and the inspirational things they did to ensure that there was better care for older people within Australia. So you know, I think it's sometimes it's really interesting what comes from a discussion like this and um, why we choose certain people. So, so the, the whole thing about this is just then to, to focus a little bit on transformational leadership. And often, like, it's about a relationship or it's about the connection in some way. And, and, and then in, in being a transformational leader, a little bit like what Cheryl said about Bill Thomas, um, you know, it's about knowing people. It's about including them, but it's also about allowing them to be who they are within the process um, and to make that contribution. So um, it is about leading, but it's also about learning. And, and transformational learning is about using the real life problems. And that's what the group problem solving process is all about. It, it's about reflecting on activities that you are involved in during the day, on your beliefs, on your perceptions, and how that impacts the care that is given. And I think that, that is really something that, that we need to remember. So, um, you know, another part of this program, and we've heard this in, in a few of the, you know, quite a few of the sessions that I attended is that one really needs to make sure that you bring in principles of adult, adult learning when you want people to do the same thing in a different way. So th that, is, um, that is the challenge. So um, it's about involving people to change their thinking and their ways of constructing meaning. Um, that would be the bottom line. So that brings us to this uh, problem-solving method. Now, really, this is nothing new. Um, problem-solving is out there in, in lots of different ways and forms, but, you know, I, I think every single program that we engage in or training that we do um, just gives us another little insight because of the way that it was put together and the person, you know, behind it who, who thought about it. So f for this one, it it's focuses on the staff's experience, and that was a big thing that we realized that people weren't asked how things impacted on them, on the team. It, it is putting yourself in the shoe of the elder, looking at the elder's experience, then trying to identify that problem. Um, you know, we're all very good with the problem solving and the brainstorming, but it's those first three steps that are really important in this process and then putting together our action plan and strategy and evaluate whether it's working and what the outcomes are. So what I want to do now, uh, I'm going to, to ask that, I'm gonna play you a, a snippet of a video. Now, this is a role play video. It is about care attendance, talking about somebody um, that they are really experiencing a lot of difficulty when they try and shower him. So I just want to sh show you a little bit, um, and I want you to look at the facilitator and what that person is doing. So we're gonna look at the first four steps a little bit of, of the um, Be an Ablement program. Thank you once again for our meeting. So, who have you been finding challenging or difficult to care for? Victor. How old is Victor? Ooh, how old is he? 80 yeah, something. 70, 76, yeah. isn't he? What's it going on for you? I've been finding he's really hard in the shower. He gets aggressive. He's scrapping. Yeah. 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 Okay, wandering and, and physically aggressive. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll mm. just drop this down. Mm. And he's screaming away, and you can't understand what he's saying because mm. he's talking in his own language. So how does it make you feel? 
when you've got you're taking him in the shower and he's screaming mm. and you're aware other people can hear. I'm, I know some of the other staff are really scared of, of mm. actually showering him, so sometimes it ends up just being a couple of us who end up having to do it. Yeah, yeah. So some people are feeling scared of him. He always looks really distressed. And they feel when he's probably doing it. Mm. Does he? Yeah. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Is oh, that... he just it's just the screaming, the way he screams. It's just like as if we're trying to kill him or something. What would you see as is the main concern then from your point of view? Frustration. Mm. Yeah, I think it's frustration. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we want to do our job and look mm. after him mm. and um, but it's just really difficult to to get get the task mm. done. Yeah, it, yeah. It, so you know. yeah, I also feel that I might be hurting him or we you know when I try. Um, and you know, wondering why he's so frightened or whatever is going on with him, I don't know. But he just won't let me. Yeah, just makes me feel like I, I'm, I'm hurting him. Be giving Victor a shower without him screaming. That would be, that would be great if that mm -hmm. happened. Okay. And I wouldn't feel so guilty. Yeah. So you've got some <coughs> feelings, feeling guilty. Mm, yeah. Okay. Is anyone else feeling a bit guilty? Yeah, I definitely feel guilty. What are we doing wrong? To mm. make he certainly like this. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and for his wife, I feel like we're sort of letting her down a bit as well. Mm. Mm. I feel concerned for how you're feeling, mm. and I think that um, that Victor's behaviours and whatever's happening for him is causing a lot of distress for you, mm. for the, re the relatives, for his wife, mm. um, as well as for him, you know. Okay, well, we'll go into step... Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop it there, so we'll go through the other steps later. I don't know, this was actually a, um, a challenge to see whether you understand Australian. Did you get on all right? Okay, so um, we'll look at the steps a little bit, uh, you know, in, in more detail as we, as we carry on. But um, just the techniques that was used, uh, people, repeating the question, making sure that, that um, she understood what people meant and felt and, and, and clarified that. So, um, and this brings us to the crux of the matter. I mean, with problem solving, what we'd like to do is to go deeper because often people try, address, try and address what they see. So it's just the top bit of that iceberg um, so the, the real problem doesn't remain visible. Um, when, the, when the video actually carries on, um, this, one of the staff members says that his wife said something about the Holocaust and whatever. So you see that there's so much that people don't understand or don't know about the person, and they just take the reaction at, at, um, at face value initially. So with the group problem-solving process, it's thinking about everything. You know, what's happening to the brain? You know, is there pain included? What's the impact of medication or infection? Is the person perhaps hungry or thirsty? Um, you know, we all know about constipation and then sleep disruption. I think there were lo lovely sessions about that. So never mind what the first impression is, we have to look at the hidden mass if we want to make sure that the person's experience meaningful relationship and purpose. Oh boy, I'm really making this thing confused because I'm swirling it around so much it looks like. But people need to experience a sense of safety, security, love, belonging, self-worth and esteem. So we need to have an understanding of what contributes to that. So this brings us to the project. So this was a pilot study, and I just want to sort of share through this what we've learned and, and how we want to do things a little bit differently. So um, it, it is all about, we looked at the nine facilitators and their perception. What did they think was the value of this program for advancing person-centered care practice of older adults who are living with moderate to advanced dementia? So after the program was run, um, actually, during it, we also get, got information, but then to analyze all that and to see what was important to know. So these things are the boring stuff, so I'm not going to go into depth, 
but um, we used the workshop evaluation form. So those were the attendees who, who did a workshop evaluation from every time they came. But what we did was the facilitators had to reflect. So part of their learning and mastering the skills of teaching the group problem solving, um, we had uh, meetings before, so we all covered the um, contents and then had a Skype meeting. Um, we stayed in contact with WhatsApp, so if somebody did something that worked well, we, we, because we did it um, sort of basically in the same week, but on different days, so those guinea pigs who went first, if they found a nice example, they'd let everybody know, or if there was a crisis, we could use the WhatsApp. And, um, but, but we generated a lot of uh, paperwork, like uh, reflective notes and the meeting minutes. Um, we even used the WhatsApp uh, to analyze all those things thematically. And in the end, after the conclusion of the program, we had this group discussion. And we really sussed out what we thought was good about this program and what needed attention. So um, if I just share the, the, the basics about this, I've already told you that we were nine facilitators who taught it. And um, our ages range from 39 to 64. Um, our experience in dementia care was between 20, oh, sorry, 10 and 23 years. And we were all involved in, in, with Alzheimer's Australia, New South Wales, in one form or the other for uh, between one and five and a half years. So those were the facilitators or the guides. For the attendees, that was a little bit of a, it was quite interesting. So yeah, I'm going to give you, I don't know, you have to translate so that you understand what the roles were. But um, we had 44% were registered nurses who attended. 40% um, were care managers. But then we also had, I don't know whether it's enrolled nurses. I still don't know what is an endorsed enrolled nurse. But in any case, they were also there. And we had acting care managers who attended. So um, showing you know, the transition and the realities within care facilities or within homes all the time, the movement of staff. OK, and the people, the, our groups that we had for attending workshops, we had between 8 and 24 people um, at, at any given time. Oh. Here we go. So the preliminary results was, um, first of all, you know, the attendees were extremely satisfied with the facilitators. And one thing, um, because it's such a large organization, they actually have in-house trainers. And this was one of the, the, which goes nationally, but this was one of the only times where they had external guides. And that made a bit of an impact. They really enjoyed the fact that somebody from outside came in. They, they were also very satisfied with the training content and the materials. Um, when they looked at their learning outcomes, the, the top three learning objectives that they felt were reached was that um, they, they appreciated behavior as an expression of a person's lived experience. That was a new insight that they felt they embraced. They felt that they, they had an approved ability to distinguish between delirium and dementia. And then lastly, um, to improve in observing and accessing, assessing pain. Because many of them forgot to think about pain and how pain would be communicated by somebody with dementia. Um, and then the personal insights um, gained, it was all about... Uh, for them, they felt they had more skills in facilitating the group problem-solving process and understanding what delirium looks like, um, which is really important. The other thing was a bigger understanding about the impact of antipsychotic drugs. And then uh, one of the things they felt they didn't get, and I wish they could have been here to attend Denise Hyde's day one workshop on leadership, but they felt that the... the there should be a greater focus on what, how do I gain a skill to be a transformational leader? Okay, good. So, um, looking at the experience, they actually felt that they would be able to use most of the things that was taught in the program. From the documentation, so things that was very interesting, things that impacted this program, and I am sure that all of you will agree when, when things happen. There were so many organizational factors. Um, you know, even though this thing was rolled out by one organization nationally, many of the facilities didn't get, it didn't filter down. They didn't get the communications. They weren't prepared. They didn't know that they had to send two people. Um, 
so it, it, th that was quite challenging. It, it also made some of the people's attitudes in the first two work, you know, first workshops, especially um, people came and they were extremely negative about the time that, that they had to spend away from. Um, and, and that contradicts what the whole program was supposed to be about. But, um, but what was interesting, and I attended a lovely session this morning about um, peer support, but that was like resident peer support. But what happened, these were, because they were care managers and registered nurses from all over the country, but never, you know, hardly saw one another, but had the same roles, the same challenges. They really became a peer support group for one another throughout this process, and that was incredibly wonderful to see. So I think, and for those, I don't think everybody got it completely right, and they were in different stages of rolling it out and implementing it, but one of the quotes that I really enjoyed most, in those facilities who were able to create a care community where they got different levels of staffing, people of different roles involved in their, in their peer group and their discussion process, you know, were, were people who really thought about things like they in, um, made it part of the uh, care plan discussion in some ways or... Um, they made it part of a communal lunch once a week to work on this. And in one facility, what happened was that the peer leader could not make it. There was some sort of a crisis. And the staff said, so we, we, really, we really want to go ahead with this. So even though they didn't attend the training or anything, they carried on with a group problem solving meeting because they all they, they had homework to do they've decided who the person was that they wanted to address that was somebody that really caused a lot of anxiety and and people didn't feel um, um, they didn't have confidence working with this person so they really wanted to speak about those with that person because they all had brought back information that they thought would be helpful so um, the facilitators, when we had our group discussion, in the end, ooh, this cut off a little bit, but so the facilitators agreed most that it provided peer support for the leadership. It gave, leadership really expressed how they felt empowered, like they had the confidence to drive change, they took ownership, um, they felt committed, they went you know, beyond what they were supposed to do. Um, they also expressed that the, it helped them to see the, the client as a person. It's not only about ticking boxes or saying it's a behavioral problem, but I think the best thing of all was that they felt that they could also use this with team members and not only with residents because it made people feel valued. So in the end, it created um, a team approach. People felt that there was a greater community of practice and um, as the facilitators left, they created their own support group and identified dates that they would speak to one another across country so that they could keep on motivating one another to implement the program and to keep at it. So now I want us to engage in a little bit of a practical session because I'd like to use them if I... So each peer leader or peer enabler, gets a booklet. And this booklet is then used during the process to support going through the steps. So what I would like is if you guys can think about somebody, you know, um, somebody that you work with that you know that staff finds it challenging, they don't have a lot of confidence, they don't know how to address it. I, you know, if each table can get a little bit of a case study going, I just thought it would be much better if you use somebody that's real rather than me giving you an artificial sort of case study. Okay, if you can quickly talk to one another and find a person that you'd like to uh, use. So the person with the, with the knowledge of that person will be your expert um, so that they can, you know, help to, to give information as you carry on. And I've put on the tables that, just like a guide that you can use, this is the process we're going to go through for the group problem solving. 
what is nice if, if it's really done in practice is to use really large, do you say butcher's paper or flip charts or whatever with your staff members. And, and what's quite interesting is that um, where people put those up so that, I mean, all the steps couldn't be covered in one meeting. So they'd put it up somewhere and people would start adding things um, and then carry on when they had their next meeting. And this was put uh, behind the staff toilet door and uh, you know, lots of very interesting places. One um, care manager thought she should put it on her back so when she does her rounds, all the staff members could look at that. But I mean, definitely it wouldn't have the name of the person on it, just the steps of the process. Okay. so. Um, so we're going to start off with, with the first step. And so what is expected of people is that they use the book. Now, um, I think that was the hardest thing. We're all busy, especially in the day-to-day -day running of, of a care facility or a home. So what um, the facilitators had to stress was that it was really important to actually read it and go through the steps in the book which, you know, it, it could a little get a bit repetitive or boring if people are in a rush. But if people took the time, so it w they had to be very mindful to follow the steps because the big problem is people want to fix. So they want to jump to that problem-solving stage. And this is to try and prevent that. So first of all, we're going to, to look at the staff experience. And excuse me, I can read better when I sit. So I'm just going to sit here and I will read it to you. So, um, so it's about focusing on understanding the staff experiences. So what you have to do now is um, help your individual staff to tell you about the problem from their viewpoint and then write key points in the staff responses under the category of staff viewpoint. So first of all, there would be certain introductory questions like, are you caring for someone whose feelings and or behavior makes it hard for you to care for them? So this puts staff completely you know, taken aback a little bit. They have to think about that. So then you ask them a focusing question. So what has happened to make it hard for you? So if you want to share that a little bit, so what has happened that made it hard for you? What does this person do that distresses you? And then if people still are hesitant to talk, you can really make, um, you focus on exploring their feelings to say things like, can you tell me how you feel when Sarah starts hitting uh, fellow residents? So make it specific to the resident or to the elder, um, but focus on the emotion behind it. Can you tell me what you feel about Sarah? And what's very important, when people take that um, leap of faith to really share their emotions, is that you have to validate it. So once people have shared things, you will then summarize. I can see that you feel, in the video it was, um, Oh, what, the word, what was the word that they used? F they was frustrated, but there was also, uh, because they felt bad about it, guilty. So that guilt, um, to say that, that I, I can hear that many of you are feeling guilty, and I note that this is not easy for you. Um, it makes sense that you have these feelings. So in, in many of the, you know, in the bits of feedback that we got from the, the peer enablers or peer leaders when they came back was that staff were, you know, with the first meeting they were blown out of the water. They didn't know whether they should respond or whether they would get in trouble to acknowledge their own emotions. It was a big thing for them to acknowledge, um, acknowledge their own um, emotions. Then we move on to the elder. So get the staff, they have now said their piece, they are in, in tune with how they are feeling, but then we, we have to get them to start understanding what is the, um, what is happening with the person. So to identify what the real problem is. So once again, there's a focus, a focus question. So um, to try, what do you think 
Mary is feeling when she hits people. Yeah, so, you know, it's logical. Anger, frustration, or is it fear? And these are sometimes when people start thinking further, but why is she doing it? Um, and then explore the elder's perception of the problem. So sometimes the elder would say something. So, you know, what does Mary say is the problem? Um, could Mary's behavior be communicating how she's feeling at that very moment? And once again, then to start summarizing. So what everybody says here is that uh, Mary feels confronted, out of control, or whatever, um, because she's not given a choice, um, or whatever. Or because I think she used to have her shower in the evening, and now we're trying to give it to her in the mornings. And sometimes, you know, logic, it's just such small things sometimes. So the next step is going to help us find out why Mary thinks and feels this way and look for the reasons that we, that we haven't yet realized. So, and then this is about the holistic expression. So then it goes on to look at the, um, to identify physical, biological, and medical factors. And, and that is something that's really important. And that's why it's really you know, good to have a range of people who actually attend this group problem solving thing. So people have to say, you know how often medical charts aren't read or the care plan is not looked at? So to ask what are the medical conditions that Mary has? Um, what's the impact of that condition? What distress does it cause? Uh, being incontinent, for example, or um, having arthritis. When, when, when something like advanced dementia dominate, how we perceive the person, we don't always look at all the other factors. So um, things like, you know, is there bio, biochemistry results? Was there any tests done recently? What does these reveal? Um, what medication is the person taking? What is Mary taking? And, and how does that impact on somebody with, who, who lives with dementia? Is there any, any other physical issues? Right? Does this person have macular degeneration? Um, you know, is this person hard of hearing, which could have a huge impact? Does this person have pain? Um, is there uh, deformities or contractures? Are we, you know, is this person coughing? Um, is there any swelling anywhere? How does the person sleep? Has Mary lost or gained weight? Um, what is her appetite like? What is she drinking? How often is she drinking? So making sure that we really cover everything and we've got everybody there because sometimes it's the person who actually goes in uh, into Mary's room who sees, you know, I, that pitcher, it's full every morning. I just refill it with fresh water so she hasn't drunk anything throughout the night or whatever or her sippy cup or whatever she's using. Um, and then now that we've looked at the now and what's happening and and we have to look at life history factors. Life history factors is extremely important. So what do we know about Mary? And her, you know, what has her friends and family told us about her? Um, do we know whether she experienced any hardship? Oh, I had a very interesting case of a lady who, um, who, who was Jewish in background, um, but lived in South Africa, but she was brought up in the UK in the war, during the war, and what she would do is she would hoard especially um, meat. She would hide her meat immediately when she got it. Staff got really angry about that. Um, but once, you know, if people start understanding what's happening. So hardships, things that are meaningful, important. We know how often when somebody's lost a child, how that features in their thoughts. Um, are there anything that's really meaningful to, the, to Mary at the moment? For example, sitting out of the sun. It's a small thing, but it's a huge thing in some ways. Um, is there anything that could influence how Mary is interpreting the situation here now? 
Has she recently lost her husband? Has her daughter moved away or has she lived with her daughter? Those kind of things. So we list what is not known as well. So many people can say things, but as we go through the questions, we could realize we've got no clue. We don't know enough to support us in our understanding of the person. So once we've looked at that, so the next focus in, in, in step two to look at the underlying issues would be to look at the um, psychosocial, spiritual, and environmental needs. So these things are, are, are um, you know, some of the most basic needs for survival, water, food, air, um, the whole thing about pain that comes up. So if somebody has pain and it's not addressed, they can't focus on anything else. And also, we have to, um, when we experience our u unique personhood, so all the things that she needs to be experience well-being, like calm, enjoyment, creativity, uh, to find meaning, a sense of hope, daily purpose. I don't know who of you are introverts. I'm definitely, I say, I went, I made awkward, and I left. It's, it's different when one presents something, but I'm not good at big crowds. I don't know what I'm going to be like if I have to live in a home, and, you know, sometimes your financial means means you've got to share a room. I think they'll find me in the cupboard most days, so I'm just going to have my little bit of space. You know, those things are really important. So... Um, so here we, we think about the living situation in the facility right now, and we can ask, um, how physically safe and emotionally secure do you think Mary might be feeling now? Um, do you think Mary feels a sense of belonging with the people in the facility? I mean, what often happens... Sorry, yes. So, did you say that this is based on Maslow's? Oh, yes, Maslow's. If we, if, you know, if we go back into the theory, which, you know due to time constraints. Maslow was, was, for Judy Weaver, that was really important, that safety, security, but it links very much with Kitwood and the work Kitwood did. So she did use both of those. Um, what often happens, I don't know, in Australia, we didn't have it as much perhaps in South Africa. Because, well, some church diminations have care facilities. I've seen people from Presbyterian here, yeah, whatever, but so, you know, it, it could be an Anglicare home or whatever. And then you might have a person who's, you know, just either don't have a specific orientation regarding faith or somebody who's got something vastly different, like being a Buddhist, um, who's actually come from another country who's a minority group and they live in the facility. And all the the, the programs, all the rituals associated with the predominant faith clashes w with this person, and they not, don't always have the ability to express that. And it's really important for us to understand that. So, you know, that sense of belonging, um, you know, things that gave them meaning previously, is it still there? Um, and what about the physical and social environment? Can they connect, just language-wise, for people? So when we think about Mary, what are the constraints to her personhood? Does she have a, 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 can she express her intellect, her spirituality, her creativity, her culture, her sexuality and her gender? You know, those things. I spoke yesterday about another research group we did, and one of the things that came out of that is that the things that residents found extremely meaningful was when staff helped them to be presentable the way that they wanted to be. The choice of clothes, you know, if there would be makeup involved, the hairstyle, those things made somebody's day, if they left their room, looking the way they wanted to look like. Not a lot of other things really mattered. It set the, the atmosphere for the day. Okay, so, so that is really looking at all the factors that can influence how. Why is this person presenting in this way? Why are they expressing their needs in, in, in such a forceful, extreme way that staff don't know how to deal with this? What are we missing? And then, obviously, 
we, it boils down to what is it? What is the bottom line? It was really interesting. Um, one of the facilities found that um, they had a gentleman who really, I mean, he was completely independent going to the toilet on his own, and when he got to the new facility, they just couldn't get him in, interested in using the, the toilet. And when they spoke to his wife, he was a fisherman all his life, uh, he was a captain of a boat, but where they lived, he could see the sea when he was standing up in front of the loop. And when they put a picture up with a view of the ocean, it changed everything. A little thing with a humongous impact for staff uh, in many ways and for him, for, for his dignity. So, um, yeah, so, so what's the bottom line? What, what do they find out? And I think one of the big things about this is listing those things that you don't know, it creates a natural means to go and speak to family and friends. Because often, you know, they are care partners, but we don't always know how to involve them. And this gives them, I always say, if you have uh, family members who are not involved, they'll take a role, but they'll take the role of the sergeant major, the protector, um, the one that really has to get at staff because things are just not right. But if they feel part of the solution from the start, if they have uh, a regular means of providing input and insight, and they can see that that is built on, it is incredible. So, getting to the central problem, and then we get to the bit that everybody is quite good at, brainstorming the ideas. So one of the key things here is, especially you know, initially when this is done, if it's people that's not been involved directly in the care, say people from catering or whatever, um, sometimes the ideas might perhaps not be as relevant, but for the brainstorming, it's really important to get people to have their say to come up with what they think. And then we'll then decide what is the most feasible. Some things we can do in the short term. Some things will be really be a long-term plan. You can't make, some changes can't happen. So, um, so form a plan, decide on those actions, and then prioritize them, what's going to be done first. And also, we, we actually told um, the peer, peer leaders that when they start with this program, and they actually think about it, um, when they look for these solutions, they must find the things that's going to have an impact short term. Because that's when, when staff, it's those, that prioritizing that's going to get them to, to provide buy-in. Because they're going to have that. They're going to see that impact. OK. What I've done now is I've talking, you, uh, spoken a lot and didn't make you do it, which is really bad, yes. Just a quick question. When you are in these groups and you're, everybody's brainstorming and just like you said, perhaps it's someone who um, is involved in their care a little bit, um, but maybe that idea isn't going to work for some reason. How do you redirect that in a positive way without making them feeling like okay. they're shut down? So, 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 so the big thing is the brainstorming is different to when we get to this. So for the brainstorming, you have a big poster. You just write everything down. Then you revisit what is the focus of the problem and say, what do you think can we start with that's a small thing that will have a big impact? And then they all look at it and decide. Okay. So it's not like you're singling somebody out okay. at all. Um, OK. So implementing that plan is really important and making sure that you know, what happens is that you might have different group problem-solving teams. You know, it, it's the people associated working with that person. So you'll have different teams in different places, but how do you communicate this? I mean, more than once people have told me it's not going to help if we put it in the care plan because everybody doesn't read it. So yes, there's certain people that, you know, if you can introduce it in when you have a care plan meeting, that's fine when the, the family comes and you can also tell them about that, but to make sure that it is communicated well. It's recorded somewhere, but if there's handover, to make sure that that is said during handover. Um, yes, each facility would have a unique way, but the 
communicate, it doesn't help that all that energy went into this process and people don't feel it's applied and they can see the impact of that. So the big thing is to evaluate it, to see the outcomes. And, and what was really nice, I know that in, in one facility, uh, because this person really took a lot of time, kept on asking to have his daughter rung, to take him home. So it doesn't matter who was at any of the front desks or who was visible, he did that every single day, all day long. Um, and when they really found out what was his interests, they got him to, um, he loved gardening, they got him just, just a simple thing like to go out and help water all the pot plants in the morning. It already gave him a feel of that he was contributing and doing something else. Um, and so the, the care manager got everybody, brought in pizzas. And they had a celebration because when they had their first day where everybody could just get on with what they're doing and give everybody more attention because he was happy. I think that's, that's important, celebrating. Um, and it's celebrating little things. Right. So, that is it from me. I have spoken way too much. I'm sorry I didn't make you do much more, but as we are little groups, <laughs> is there anything that you think with the people that, that, that you have identified that some of these steps might actually put another light on the situation that staff is experiencing and help them to delve a little bit deeper? Yeah, that being feeling included. I, I think for me, uh, what people said, it was actually those first two steps, because what's, what often happens is the staff that are not involved in clear plan meetings and things, they get very upset if somebody, um, you know, if there's somebody who's, who gets angry and they lash out, whoever is closest, and often will be the most frail person or somebody in the wheelchair who can't get away quick enough, and it makes people observing that, you know, angry and, and they have feelings against this resident so they, or the elder. So they just really, when they see them, they walk to the other side, they don't greet them, whatever. So getting them to acknowledge their feelings, but then thinking about, but why is this person doing that? What are they feeling? When do you lash out? Why would you lash out? Um, so I think the combination of those two things is very powerful. But then it needs to be with, with everybody. Um, you know, if, if your mother is the person that is in the receiving end of getting a nice whack every morning, it, it would be good to share perhaps some of those things. And, um, yeah, because aggression, uh, sometimes family members come in and they really want to defend. I mean, I will not let somebody hit my mother, but that could cause a huge overreaction. So getting people on board in the understanding and being part of the process. Yeah, I think um, kind of, you know, what you said, it puts people in a better mindset to solve the problem by doing that in the beginning. Because sometimes there will be a problem. I'll go to my caregiver and say, okay, this is obviously a problem. What are we going to do? And they're still mad and still reeling from the situation. But giving them that time to feel their feelings and then making them not making them, but helping them to really see the other side of the resident's experience, it totally levels out and makes that a better conversation to come up with solutions. It's not based on um, just the emotion or the immediate emotion. Yes, and, and they are part of the solution. I think that, that, that is what you say. Being part of the solution makes all the difference because you, you carry part of wanting it to be a success. It's not somebody else's idea and I have to do it. Anything else anybody would like to share? Yes, please. I like the idea of 
I'm sorry, I'm going to give you this so that the people at the back can also hear. Thank you. I like the idea of separating the feelings of the person and then instead of just isolating the behavior. So we're looking at the feelings of the person after we look at the feelings of the um, staff. Yeah. yeah, I think that order makes a big difference too. I wonder, um, I mean, all these things, uh, perhaps it's because for, for me, the, the meaningful engagement part, the client said this, knowing what the person enjoys, the life story, you see, th that would be the, the perspective I take when I look at somebody. And I, it, for me, it was a huge wake-up call thinking about pain. How does pain present itself? Um, I, you know, I, the, and the other preconceived ideas, I wish I could show you some. The, there's a beautiful video that, that uh, people in Tasmania has made. It, it's about a gentleman. Um, you know, it's finding the right thing for the person. So this, this man, he's, um, he had two daughters. And his wife um, was at home during the day, so she looked after him. But at night, I think that only there was like an 11-month age difference between them. So his role, he didn't mind getting up at night. And he just could not settle, and he got extremely aggressive. And they gave him two dolls. I cry every time I see that video, because doll therapy is something that, well, I don't know, you know, the word therapy is perhaps not always the right, right word to use as well. But, you know, some pay, uh, in some instances, staff then deals with a person as if they were a child playing with dolls. But what was amazing about this video is how he engages, how he talks to the dolls, he shares them with the staff, um, he makes sure that they're comfortable, and at night, um, he puts them to bed, and then the staff says they'll take care of them so he doesn't have to get up. So they take them away in their little crib. But it is amazing how he relates much more to those two dolls than to anybody else, and he can use that to invite other people in, like he was like proud of his two babies and shared them with other people. So, you know, different things for different people. But it's amazing when there's something that works and how everybody can celebrate in that. Do you perhaps have a, a nice little story that you'd like to share about something that really worked, that was a surprise? I'm, I'm really challenging you now. Everybody's tired. It's nearly lunchtime. There's about five minutes left. I have, um, or perhaps a bit more. I've rushed now. So I was so afraid that I wouldn't get done. So I'll be here if anybody needs to ask me something or talk about anything. If you want to look at the little facilitator's guide. Um, this program is available through Alzheimer's Australia, New South Wales. So if you are interested in it, you can email me. Um, on the next slide, I'll have all my contact details. It's also, you know, if, if you download the slides, it's, it's on there. And I can put you in contact with, with, the, um, with the correct person at Alzheimer's Australia, New South Wales. But you know, the, for me, the big thing is, is just an idea. Um, but you can't teach people how to problem solve if you don't equip them with understanding the whole situation. So you know, it, there's no easy solutions. Dementia is complex. It's about empowering and equipping people. Um, and it's about everybody. I, I felt a bit disappointed in one of the sessions that I attended. And I can also, I can understand it that people said, but they'd rather want a dementia specialist to come in. And we need that because a person like that can support people. But it's everybody's responsibility to work with everybody. Um, it's everybody's responsibility to make it someone's home. It cannot only be the responsibility of one or two people. I, I know that the, the recreation people get the brunt of the meaningful engagement and the involvement. It, it doesn't work like that if, if somebody you know, if somebody's laying a table and there's somebody there and they enjoy it, that person needs to feel that they are equipped to get the elder to help them do it, uh, to arrange the flowers. You know, somebody likes 
My mother loves brooms. My husband always asks her whether she wants a new one for Christmas with them so that she can visit him using it. So um, there's a lot of bickering going on between the two of them. But, you know, people have different things that they enjoy doing. And it, you know, it depends who's in the vicinity, who's sharing the moment, and that can make that moment meaningful, and that's what we want. That's what we like. So I, um, I love this quote uh, about, uh, from Cicely Saunders who says, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can to help you to live until you die. And that's, that's what we do as um, people working in this industry. You can't work here and not care. So thank you very much for your time. You're welcome to come and talk to me.